The large facial bones that surround the nasal cavity, the frontal bone, the maxilla, the sphenoid and ethmoid bones are hollow to a greater or lesser extent. The hollow spaces in these bones contain the paranasal sinuses, which in the healthy living body are filled with air. The paranasal sinuses all communicate with the nasal cavity. To see the sinus cavities, we'll look at a skull in which part of the bone that overlies each sinus has been removed. Here's the cavity for the right frontal sinus. There's a left one, too, on the other side of this partition. The frontal sinus extends upward behind the lower part of the forehead and also, to a variable extent, backwards between the roof of the orbit and the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. Here's the cavity for the right maxillary sinus, also known as the maxillary antrum. It extends backwards to the part of the maxilla that borders the pterygo maxillary fissure. It extends downwards almost to the root of the upper molar and premolar teeth. The medial wall of the maxillary sinus is also the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Its roof forms a large part of the floor of the orbit. The sphenoid sinuses occupy the central part of the sphenoid bone. This opening has been made to show the right sphenoid sinus. To see it better, we'll look at the skull divided in the midline. Here's the right sphenoid sinus again. Above the sphenoid sinus is the floor of the anterior cranial fossa and the cella tersica. Behind it is the basilar part of the occipital bone. In front of it is the high part of the nasal cavity. Below it is the roof of the nasopharynx. Lastly, we'll come round to the front to look at the collection of small cavities that contain the ethmoid air cells, collectively referred to as the ethmoid sinus. These extend from just behind the nasolacrimal duct all the way back along the medial wall of the orbit. As we've seen already, the ethmoid air cells lie between the medial wall of the orbit and the lateral wall of the upper part of the nasal cavity. Before we go further, we need to catch up on something that we left unfinished in the previous section, understanding the ethmoid bone. We've encountered the various parts of the ethmoid bone, but till now we've put off seeing the whole of it. We'll do that now. Then we'll come back and look at the openings of the paranasal sinuses. The ethmoid bone is a fragile coalition of parts. The best way to see all of them is to go back to the skull that was divided in the frontal plane. All of this is the ethmoid bone. This part, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, forms a large part of the bony nasal septum. This upward projection is the beginning of the crista galli, which rises up in the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. On each side of the crista galli are the cribriform plates, which we've seen already from above and from below. The most lateral part of the ethmoid bone is this paper-thin layer, the lamina papyracea, which forms this part of the medial wall of the orbit. Between the lamina papyracea and the upper part of the nasal cavity are the ethmoid air cells, as we've seen. The superior and middle conchi are also parts of the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone is joined to the frontal bone above, the maxillae below, and the central part of the sphenoid bone behind. Now that we've seen the ethmoid bone, we'll return to the cavities for the paranasal sinuses and see how they connect with the nasal cavity. We'll look at the openings for the frontal and maxillary sinuses first. Here's the frontal sinus cavity. Here's the maxillary sinus cavity, seen through an artificial opening. 
The frontal and maxillary sinuses both open in this complex area beneath the middle conker, which we need to look at in more detail. In a dry skull, there are two large irregular openings from the nasal cavity into the maxillary sinus, separated by this flake of bone, the uncinate process. In the living body, all of this opening and much of this one are closed off by soft tissue. The real opening of the maxillary sinus is back here. If we look in from in front, we can see that the opening is quite high on the medial wall of the maxillary antrum. The frontal sinus opens into the nasal cavity by way of a narrow passage, the frontonasal duct. The frontonasal duct starts above the uncinate process and runs upward and forward to reach the frontal sinus. The frontal and maxillary sinuses open into the nasal cavity, not directly, but into a narrow side chamber located here, called the infundibulum. The infundibulum isn't apparent in a bony specimen. We'll see it when we look at the soft tissues. Now we look at the openings for the other sinuses. The sphenoid sinus opens into the nasal cavity here, above and behind the superior concha. The ethmoid air cells, which are up in this region, have several small openings into the nasal cavity. Some of these are behind the middle concha, some of them are below it. There are two more openings to see in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. The opening for the nasolacrimal duct, or tear duct, and an opening for nerves and blood vessels, the sphenopalatine foramen. As we've seen, the bony passage for the nasolacrimal duct starts here. The nasolacrimal duct, which is quite short, passes downwards and backwards to open beneath the inferior concha. Here's its opening. The last opening to look at, the sphenopalatine foramen, is the inner end of a short tunnel for blood vessels and nerves to the nose and palate. On the inside, it opens near the back of the superior meatus. We'll go all the way round to the outside to see the other end of the sphenopalatine foramen, which is here, in the depths of the pterygomaxillary fissure. All the paranasal sinuses and the nasolacrimal duct for the tears open into the nasal cavity. To see their openings into the nasal cavity, we'll remove the conchae. The inferior concha was here. Here beneath it is the opening for the nasolacrimal duct. Beneath the middle concha, which was here, is a deep groove called the semilunar hiatus. To see where this leads, we'll retract its lower border with this thread. The semilunar hiatus leads into a narrow, irregular side chamber called the infundibulum. The infundibulum receives the openings of the frontal sinus and the maxillary sinus. Sometimes the more anterior ethmoid air cells open into the infundibulum too. Sometimes, as in this case, they open separately, below the middle concha. Here's where the superior concha was. The more posterior ethmoid air cells open below the superior concha. The sphenoid sinus, which is this cavity, opens forwards into the highest part of the nasal cavity, the sphenoethmoidal recess. Here's the frontal sinus cavity in a different specimen. The opening to the frontonasal duct is behind here. To see the other sinus cavities, we'll take a look from the outside at a dissection in which all the facial soft tissues have been removed. Here's the maxillary sinus cavity, opened from in front. The opening from the sinus into the infundibulum is all the way up here on the medial wall. Here are the ethmoid air cells, with the lamina papyracea removed. This opening in the medial wall of the orbit also exposes the infundibulum.